we are here in America with the Harland Report in order to examine what really is going on with the American culture because there seems to be crisis all over the place. I'm speaking now uh, to you, Woodley August. You are a marketing executive and an entrepreneur originally from Haiti. Uh, and your parents came here and this makes you especially interesting in our view because uh, you then have an international uh, ability and to see the world from different perspectives and we feel that maybe this is something that the Americans need to do more. And we're talking now about uh, President uh, Donald Trump because we've seen with this presidency a remarkable hatred uh, towards the president and the nation seems to be engulfed in such an anger and hatred man against woman a ravaging feminism man hating feminism we have all of the sudden America which used to be such a a, a nation a multicultural melting pot now seems to think more and more in ethnic terms and this has really exploded on Donald Trump and Europeans wonder what's wrong with America? How can the leading news outlets such as CNN, all they do is hate him? And we're wondering what's going on? Can you give us an analysis on what's gone so wrong with Donald Trump? Yes, uh, well, thank you, Hannah, for having me. Uh, I think what's taking place is that we are now reverting to tribalism. Uh, it is vastly more important to talk about my tribe versus the whole the, of all of America. We only look at it through the lenses of who am I, what color am I, uh, what's my income level, what's my background, and that is all I'm interested in, worried specifically about my group of people. And as long as they fit within my desired, you know, gender, race, etc., then I could not care less about anyone else. Um, and CNN, regardless of whatever the president does, they merely exasperate, uh, exacerbate excuse me, his flaws. So if the market, the financial market performs well, very little of that is reported. It's merely whatever he may have said uh, on Twitter um, <laughs> or, or policy that may have affected uh, a specific group that may, may be considered marginalized, that will be played up all the more uh, in the hopes of changing the perception of what the president uh, can and is doing uh, here affecting the executive branch of government. It's very interesting when Trump, uh, whether one particularly, uh, you know, endorsed him or likes him as a person or not, when he first became president, he was very clear that uh, some of the ideas he had was really quite socialist, to be honest, or left-wing. He wanted to get jobs back to America, uh, to the working class of America. I mean, somebody who tries to care for the working class, the Detroit areas, and, you know, I mean, get, get uh, manufacturing back. Secondly, he wanted to reduce the possibility of the ultra-rich in America to store all their goods in Cayman Islands, to get uh, people and um, Facebook and George Soros and all of those who have all their companies over there to, to start paying taxes in America again. He spoke about trying to reduce the importance of the Chinese in order for the Americans to prosper, and yet Everybody hates the guy. <laughs> well, it's it's perceived that he's you know when when his slogan, which was taken from Ronald Reagan, "Make America Great," uh, many viewed, particularly uh, non-whites, viewed it as he was only interested in a specific race of white Americans, not necessarily any other community. And Donald Trump is is President Trump is is a unique uh, individual because he doesn't follow the rules, and because there is a lack or a perceived lack of decorum, that translates into uh, a, a disdain uh, by everyone because they, they view him as he's not an intellectual. Uh, whereas you look at his, the previous president where uh, President Obama was romanticized almost to the point of, of, of Messiah uh, to many people that he somehow was going to change the world and do everything, and it was borderline socialism. Uh, <laughs> whereas Donald Trump says, well, no, this is, this is the antithesis of the American values. I want to do something different. 
but the press decry, no, that's wrong. This is somehow going to affect all marginalized communities and there will be no improvement. You're going to suffer. Things are going to be worse. He's taking away all these things from you. When really and truly, at the core, I think he wants what everyone wants. They want to prosper. They want to experience the American dream. However, we have to ask ourselves, who is the person, who is the group that this is for, this making America great? That's the question. I've always stated that if I was an American, I definitely would vote libertarian with uh, Dr. Ron Paul. As, I just as think, I, as I did. <laughs> really? Okay, yes. yes. I think he's so brilliant. He's he's such, got such a realistic view on the Middle East and on foreign policy. He's such a knowledgeable guy. But let me not go into hailing him. But um, just to add, for example, under Obama, that wall against Mexico was already ahead being built. Yes. But then once Trump comes and says, we'll build the wall, from what I understood, keep out the illegal immigrants, not against Mexicans per se. I mean, half of Mexico already lives in the United States, <laughs> you know, and the half of South America really already lives in the United States. So there's obviously many good things since everybody wants to come here. But it's strange, nobody focused on Obama building that wall, but once President Trump came, then it was such a horrible thing. And secondly, I saw a rating of who really voted for Trump. So many of the Mexicans that are legally in Texas and many of those states voted for him because they say that all the illegal immigrants flooding in are uh, creating a situation where we as legal migrants are not respected anymore. And so many of the African Americans uh, along that area, when you look at who really voted for him on that issue, but all of this is quenched in that CNN yes. narrative of hatred. Yes, it's always, we always have to ask ourselves, who is, who is agenda is being pushed here? And that is where critical analysis is the foundation of everything. You know, asking those tough questions, why? Why is CNN playing up all of this rather than not talking about the other things that may be going on? And, you know, regardless of the fact, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, as a, as a nation, the president has very little impact on day-to-day -day going ons of its citizenry. I can prosper whether it's under a Democrat or a Republican. It's, it's, you know, because I have a desire and I position myself to do as such. Whereas other people will, they'll, they'll immediately shift the blame and say, well, the president is the problem for every social ill that's happening. That's a misnomer. It's not. There has to be some self-responsibility that's taken up. As, as it relates to President Trump, I think because of his language, some of his rhetoric, uh, where it comes from a place, whether it's uh, of ignorance to certain facts, uh, like what he said just recently about African countries in the Caribbean, which my family is from. I'm from one of those countries he mentioned. And he made the claim and he said, well, why don't we get more people like Norway? Well. <laughs> This is so interesting, too, because, um, again, uh, the president is pulling the ethnic card, and I think that is always a mistake. Individuals should be judged on their competence, their level of willingness to work hard, rather than, than, than pulling the ethnic card. Uh, and that is one of the, at the root of the problem in the United States today, really. And I think this may be also at the root of the issue why uh, President Obama was romanticized to such a degree, while the president before George Bush was vilified in Europe especially. Oh man, did we hate uh, <laughs> President George Bush due to the Iraq war he instigated and started the Iraqi war. We hated that so much and we live much closer to the Middle East. So we see how millions of, of people that live in the Middle East lose their homes, are killed and all of that. We live on the receiving end of the American bombs, to put it that way. But still, when you look at Obama, he started more wars and engaged in more wars than George Bush ever did, but Correct. nobody spoke about that. No. Look at all the dr using of drones in Pakistan. They're killing regular families on the way to work or back in Kandahar and many places. In Look at the situation in Yemen. We're not going to go into the Middle Eastern uh, issues right here, but we're just addressing, you know, the simple yes. fact that 
there's just so many issues here that pop out of uh, the fact that ethnicity now is at the core of it, as also Donald Trump's comment Correct. illustrates. Absolutely. His comments illustrate that there is a level of ignorance that takes place. Uh, and to your point about with President Ob uh, Obama, when those strikes went out, I think most Americans resign themselves to, to believe somehow that this was not impacting the world because it became almost nebulous because there were drones involved. There weren't American soldiers. There weren't American military that was involved. It was, it was very removed because, well, it's a, it's a drone. It's a plane that's unmanned. So it doesn't really count when it does count. <laughs> it certainly does because people are dying. And it's a strange thing, too, when you look at Norway, almost half of the workforce in Norway are on welfare. We have spent and used our billions and billions of dollars oil revenue. We have funneled it into a system of benefits so that half, almost half of the Norwegian workforce now uh, is on benefits. And we've done the exact opposite as, for example, the Arab Emirates mm -hmm. and many of the small nations also in the Far East. Once they found the oil, they said, OK, how can we use the oil to create something great here? And they did not funnel it into a benefit and a welfare system, uh, but rather they built their countries up using that money into a strong workforce. Yes. Uh, and it's an irony that <laughs> what Trump really asks for is for a, big, a nation like Norway with all its welfare recipients to come to the US. Is it that? Or would he prefer to have the p young people from Africa and the African elites who live here mostly, yes. you know, to come and really do an excellent work in the United States? If I was him, I would much rather pick the African <laughs> elite rather than the Norwegians on welfare. Correct. Well, it, 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 uh, I read a recent report that said just in Kenya, the standard of living, because there are so many postgraduate workers there, is much higher than here in the United States. Throughout the diaspora, you have Africans, you have those from the Caribbean that immigrate to countries like the United States, and they immediately contribute. Uh, growing up, my family never collected welfare. In fact, I distinctly remember my parents saying, we don't want anything from the government. We'll do it ourselves. Now, that's an a, 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 a interesting comment coming from immigrants, not saying that they want a handout, but will come and work. You know, here in Miami, you have a large population of Haitians. Many of them will, first generations, they come here, they don't speak English. They'll work jobs, menial jobs, and then their children will grow up here as Americans, and they immediately will step up even higher than their parents, uh, their parents', uh, their parents economic standard. They'll, they'll increase that um, subsequently. And that's why I think many people were offended instead of asking themselves, they just listened to one comment and said, well, President Trump hates all of these people and he hates people of color. And instead of examining and saying, well, yes, there are some problems in our countries. That's why many of us left. However, the delivery is part of the issue that I think many have with President Trump. It's how the, how the communication was, was submitted, how it went forth. What we say in Europe, or many say in Europe, is that the sorry, let's say, state of affairs in, in the US and the decadence, the American decadence, the America is not what it used to be, is reflected also in the choice of Trump. Yes. It's a choice that also stems from the problematic situation that uh, your country, America, really is in. Mm -hmm. I ag agreed, because I, I think that, again, there, there's a, a romantiz uh, romanticization of the, the quintessential American. The, there's a certain bravado or a gravitas that's present into what America is supposed to be. There's a swagger that comes along with it. And, you know, because as Americans, we, we love entertainment. Uh, I think when Donald Trump first decided to run for public office, people were enamored by it. Because for, if you look back at the history, many people really you know, were enthralled with President Trump when he was a reality star. He had money, he had power, he had fame, he had women, all those things that you know, lived a very excessive life, all the opulence in his home. And Americans really enjoyed that till he decided to run for office. 
And then they saw some of his political agenda or heard some of his political agenda and said, well, wait a minute, we don't want that. Well, <laughs> there's a, then we have to look at ourselves. There has to be a moment of introspection and saying, well, if that's the case, then how did we allow this to happen? When you compare, for example, the United States and China now, I mean, China has surpassed uh, the U.S. in, you know, many ways now. When you go to the Chinese and the Asian airports, they're wonderful. And when you come to the United States, it's like coming to the 1970s. When you look at the Chinese system, for example, President Xi, in order to become president in China, you have to have 40 years or 30 years of political education, yes. academic education. But here in the United States, it, it's more like um, some of the South American countries where a football star now becomes president because yes. everybody votes for him. And, and, and isn't really that a degradation? Looking at now uh, Oprah Winfrey, who's also a TV star, Correct. fighting uh, Donald Trump, in the, and he's saying, I'll beat you at the next election, and <laughs> she'll saying, I'll be the president. And none of them really have been educated in politics or have gone, mm -hmm. gone the long road it takes. So even that speaks for a, a, a terrifying deterioration in the American system. Absolutely. Absolutely, because you, as we're seeing the, the rise of the reality star, we, we become enamored with someone else living vicariously through someone's life. And just recent, just a few years ago when uh, another, reality, another musician said, well, I'm going to run for office, and people were immediately saying, this could be true. Could, could this musician, this popular musician, now become the next president of the United States? And the office of the president has been denigrated, where there's very little thought, there's very little intellectual capital invested into leading a country properly, making sure that you understand the intricacies of government um, for any position. For example, for you, you are well trained in, in understanding Middle Eastern thought. Having been immersed in Africa, all those things lend itself to what you do with the Herlin Report. Why is it, if that's the requirement for what you do, or the basis of what you do, why isn't that not part of what happens with the leader of the free world, of the superpower with nuclear weapons? Yeah, and I think there's a great surge in other countries in the world now to try to break the back of America by uh, uh, attacking the dollar for one. And, yes. and that's another a whole other question. And uh, I would like to point out too that the, many of these issues that we cover here is what I cover. Uh, in uh, my newly released book here in the United States, The Culture War, how the West lost its greatness. And these kinds of cultural analysis, more than detailed talks about Brennan or Trump or persons coming in and out, all of that you'll find on CNN. But mm -hmm. the broad overlooking what's happening in a culture and the questions then come up as well you know what is the future of america if uh, one is not able to rise above the hatred group against group which to be honest very often ends in civil war yes. uh, all around the world if one is not able to rise above that and and find national unity and work together uh, I think America really is in deep uh, trouble. Yes, lawless, lawlessness will abound um, because we're, you know, we, we tend to, as Americans, focus on a personality. Uh, but really, the truth of the matter is, we're dealing with ideology. We're dealing with a certain frame of thought, and instead of combating ideas and looking at it, we then we tend to personify and say, well, this one person espouses this, and they're the problem. No. It's far greater than that. Um, when it comes to issues of race, when it comes to issues of economics, you know, these ills that we're facing here in the United States are much broader. They're very intricate. So there's a, there's a lot of minutia. But instead of asking, well, how did this person arrive at these conclusions? How did, what caused them to believe what they believe, whether factual or not, we tend to focus and say, well, it's the person that's the problem. No just like with the press. It's, the, it's not the press that's the problem, it's the people behind the press that becomes the issue at hand. Because it's an agenda that's being appropriated and that of course affects the people because they will believe everything that they see and hear. And that brings us to a very crucial point, again in American culture, to the question of uh, are we leaving democracy? 
are we becoming somewhat more a totalitarian democracy in which the people behind the scenes uh, and the ultra-rich behind the scenes control both the Federal Reserve, uh, much of the big Wall Street money controls also uh, the media, and is it in somebody's agenda that we should hate each other? Is it in somebody's who's earning money mm -hmm. on what's going on? And that's really follow the money, I mean, that's Absolutely. a saying. Yes, you follow the money, look at the prison system, follow the money, uh, privatize slavery follow the money. <laughs> uh, corporations, uh, you know, again, we're not, we don't look at just the personification of, you know, of what this evil figure is. I mean, that's far too simplistic. But when we look and we examine where the money is coming from to influence those things, whether it's dark money for political advocacy group committees, uh, the super PACs, you know, many of those things were funded for years by the Koch brothers, who were not necessarily interested in impacting politics. They wanted to further their business. Even they had a problem with President Trump uh, because of his stance on immigration, because it would impact their corporations. There's something there. It's very interesting <laughs> uh, speaking with you, Mr. Woodley August, and we thank you very much for joining us thank here you, on Anna. the Herland Report and enlightening us thank you. on what's really going on in America. Yes, thank you. And I enjoyed reading your book, by the way. It was very fascinating. It really provided a, a foundation of where uh, Western thought came from and why we're seeing some of the ills that are taking place in society, both here in the United States as well as Europe. Thank you. Thank you.